So let's get started with our session. Uh, welcome. Thanks for being here. My name is Elisa Stovall. I am a consultant with the IEP Resource Center. I am here with my colleague, Jessica Benhack, who uh, I am just thrilled to have a, as, a, as a partner in, in uh, sharing out information on uh, how you might develop a behavior plan today and, and addressing some behavior skills. So let's go. There are two outcomes that um, we're really looking to, to uh, reach today. The first, if you're new to the process, um, this might be a, a learning curve for you. If you are familiar with um, developing behavior intervention plans, then this may just be a review. Either way, um, we welcome you here. And we want to also try to expand your collection of, of resources in regards to behavior intervention. So that is where we're, we're heading today. And just to keep us kind of you know, in the realm of, of um, why we're here and what we're doing, um, this is all a part of the process of supporting learners. They have a path, they have a journey uh, through these educational years. And the, the ultimate outcome is, is for them to leave our schools, leave our buildings with skills for life. And uh, that, that hat at the top of the stairway is, is a graduation hat, but we know that students have more than just maybe a diploma or a piece of paper, they have skills that they take forward. And we're a part of that development of skills. And so just, just want to, um, keep that in front of us as or somewhere in our, our thinking as we talk today. This is all a part of teaching and learning, developing a behavior intervention plan. And there are actually two, two separate parts that we're going to touch on today. Uh, the first is in order to develop a plan, we need to start with a, a well informed hypothesis. Why this behavior? Why is this the behavior we're seeing from this student? Why is it interfering with their success in a specific setting in the school? So we'll spend some time talking about how to develop that, that why, that hypothesis. And then the second part is once we have that information, we're gonna take very deliberate steps to reshape the students, what I call learning scape. We're gonna plan for explicit instruction. We're gonna intentionally make changes to the environment. We're gonna implement whatever plan we develop with fidelity, and we're gonna monitor ourselves to make sure that we're, we are um, providing the instruction and the student is making progress. And then we're gonna document all that we do and report that out and hopefully celebrate at some point. So as we start, I, I wanna, I know it's, it's difficult, particularly these days when we are so stretched, but the best work that we do around supporting students with behavior is done um, with a team. It's very difficult to do on your own, almost impossible to do on your own, but you know, we, we do what we need to do, but we really wanna encourage you to consider a, a multidisciplinary team, a group of people that have knowledge base around behavior or around students and learning and growth, we want individuals that have had um, different experiences with the student in particular that we're talking about. We wanna know about successes and things that go well as in addition to talking about the behaviors that concern us. If we're talking about a student with an IEP, an individualized education program, then there are some legal requirements that we need to consider. And there would be case conference members uh, as a part of the process. We would have to document our actions in the IEP. There might be reevaluation timelines, but this isn't a process that's just tied to students with, with specialized services and supports. We may have any student that might need to have behavioral supports. And, and so this is a process that could be used for any student in, in our environment. So keep that in mind. But let's get, let's get on with this team piece. Um, who would be the individuals that if you're gonna go on this behavioral journey that you would wanna have alongside helping you make a decision, decide what to do, how to do it, <clears throat> excuse me. Some of them are, are probably the, the roles that you have, those of you that are in this, this chat room right now, teacher record, teacher service and so on, um, school administrators. We wanna include the student. Even the, the youngest students, you know, th there's some information that we can, can um, get from them. 
in regards to their own behavior and, 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 and maybe some whys and hows. Um, but then there are also family members that should be participating and, and then school support staff. And most of us can reach the, this list of individuals, but here's some, some additional ones you might wanna consider. Someone from the community, we need to have somebody that has some positive rapport and has had that with the student. It would be a sad day if we can't find anybody that has a positive relationship with the student. But that's also you know, something that we would need to, to, to look more deeply in. If there isn't a connection, perhaps that's part of the reason we are having the behavioral concerns that we have. Maybe it's an instructional assistant or someone that, that um, works with the student in the cafeteria or brings the student to school. It's almost, it is critical. I shouldn't say almost critical. And in my beliefs, it's, it's critical that we have someone that has that positive rapport with the student. Someone should be involved in this process with us. So keep that in mind. Now, it may be difficult to, to get to, but let's try to pull together people that, that can provide a rich understanding of the student and help us. So I'll, I'll set that aside for a moment. This is where the process begins. There's a behavior of concern that we need to address. It may be formally, again, as in this, this depiction of the IEP system, and this is where we start to document things. But even if there's not an IEP involved, or we really need to start thinking about, what is it, how do we identify this, this behavior? What, what does it look like? What does it sound like? When does it happen? Where does it happen? And is this even a behavior that, that we can agree on is, is concerning? So sometimes it comes down to it, is the behavior that I see as the instructor or as, as an adult watching the student, is it really a behavior of concern? And what I have on the screen here for you is, is on some different behaviors. Are these behaviors of concern? Some of you might say yes, some might say maybe, some might say no, but what raises a behavior to a level of concern? Because it may have more to do with the intensity or, or how often it happens or where it happens. Within the school context, what I'd like you to think about is when it's a behavior that's gonna remove the student from instruction, because that's what we do in schools, teaching and learning. If we're removing a, school, a student from instruction, that means they may no longer be a part of the lesson for the day. Sometimes we say, well, you know, Elisa, you go and sit back at your desk and you stay there while the rest of us go on with this, this activity. So they're no longer part of the, the lesson or the activity. Sometimes they're no longer in the classroom or even in the school building. And we recognize how, how much more um, quickly how that's, that's a behavior that's, that's dangerous because they're away from instruction and that's our first focus in school. Of course, if it's harmful, sometimes they're behaviors that isolate students from others and they, they self-isolate, that can be a concern. And then there's always the piece of regularly interrupting the instructional flow, what's going on in the classroom or the student pulls themselves, themselves or others off task. So, we have to decide whether this is a behavior of concern. And it's, it's sometimes easier to do this when you have a team to take it to, okay? So something to think about. When, we, when we're ready to take that behavior, whatever it is, to the team or to consider it with, with parents and others, maybe there's a, a, an opportunity to, to step back for a moment to make sure that um, one, in our setting, we're, we have an idea of what behaviors are of concern, just in general. Have we ever talked as a staff about um, collectively labeling, what does, it, what does it look like in our space if someone is talking back? Or what does it sound like? Or what is it, um, what's a hit versus a slap? Um, Maybe we need to take some time and identify critical behaviors that are worthy of, of a discipline referral collectively so that we can, we can have a, a general understanding of what our expectations are and what 
um, we are teaching to our, our learners in regards to how to move through those expectations. And so there, there's actually a um, on the Padlet, when we go there in the um, resources section, there's kind of a take home task that I would um, recommend while uh, you pull out and have a conversation with your, your school team or your grade level where you actually identify this is what hitting is. So we know the difference between a hit and a slap or a push or um, any other physical behavior that you want to define or what is um, verbal defiance? Might be worth taking a look at and I'll leave that for you as a, as a sidebar piece. Wish we had uh, enough time today to work through all of these things, but we'll see. Regardless, when we have a behavior that we think needs to be carried forward, we want to make sure that it's within the repertoire of skills that and expectations that we have already talked about with students and already practiced and already uh, supported with, with feedback so that then we actually know if they're outside of the boundaries of our expectations. So I'll leave that to you to do some more heavy thinking on. And, and um, in a minute, I'll, well, I'll say in a minute, I'll give you a chance to respond to that or, or um, ask any questions. Let's do that now. What do you think? Would it be worthwhile to have a discussion about what are the expectations here and, and, and define those behaviors in your setting? See any, is there anything going on in the chat, maybe, Jessica? or? I don't see anything at the okay. moment, but okay. um, for your thoughts, yeah. comments. Yeah, someone did say yes. Um, just hard to find time to meet with others is what some are noticing. If anyone has any good good ideas about how to connect when time is is short, please share those out. Um, Janice noticed that it would be <laughs> worthwhile but getting the time to gather is hard. Um, yeah. Yeah, that time factor. And, you know, it, it's something that, you know, I, someone has, has mentioned shared documents that, you know, that you have common documents that everybody can access and, and um, add to the discussion uh, around just what we're going to define as, as behaviors. Maybe this is something that happens um, outside of the, the school year, you know, as a project with a team over the summer and you know just defining where we are and, and what our expectations are behaviorally and then how we're going to teach those out to students because that sets the framework for when we know students are, are, are outside of that range that we need to, to maybe take some action. Um, Janice suggested maybe create a module people can view on their own time and discuss virtual or virtually. Mm -hmm. Anything like that. Great. Great. Well, as we move through this, it's sometimes easier to think of a kiddo, you know, or have somebody in, in mind when, when we're working through this process. And, and I don't want you to use one of your own students to take a break from that. Um, but we're going to we're going to have Jeff as our uh, our student for the, the time we're together. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about Jeff. This is the report that we're getting from his classroom. He's been having difficulty paying attention in class and inattentive, disruptive. Um, the behaviors that really seem to be of concern are that um, during work time, he'll, he'll leave a seat and, and crumple up his papers and get angry. You know, if somebody notices, he responds to them with cursing or, or threats towards those peers. And if those behaviors occur, it's, it's almost every day. And sometimes it's multiple times across the day. So it's really starting to disrupt his his uh, school day, his instructional time. And um, it doesn't last long, but sometimes he, you know, he can't, it can be several minutes before he's kind of back to work on things. And, and collectively that time is, is you know, it's a lot of time across his day or across his week that he's away from instruction and kind of frustrated. Uh, and the, of course the, the verbal outbursts are, are disrupting other students as well. Uh, most of the time his classmates ignore him and it kind of, you know, kind of settles down, but it, it can pop back up across the day. And it really is starting to affect his workflow and, and his ability to get along with his fears. So th this might be the, the first report that you, you would hear from a teacher or two about Jeff. 
So if we're gonna move this forward from a concern to maybe something more, um, the team needs to get together and, and have some discussion and make some decisions. And before they can make those decisions in Article 7, the law requires us to consider two things. Um, the first being, the, is there a pattern of behavior to be concerned about? And we've defined this within the IEP system, if, you, if you've gone into that, that section, we've defined this as repeated occurrences of the behavior in one or more settings. So the behavior occurs with a predictable set of triggers. We're looking for sameness. Is it the same activity? Is it the same time of day? Um, is it in the same environment or with the same expectations around them? Is it about the type of activity? It's always when the noise level is high or when the noise level is low and it's quiet. Or it's about the structure that we're in. You know, students are, are, are working independently. Um, those are patterns of behavior that that can push us towards the, uh, the answer to, is this really a behavior of concern? The second definition, and this is also found um, in the IEP system and, and defined, impeding, which we've defined as interfering with the ability to participate in or focus on a learning activity. And that can be my learning or it could be someone else's learning. So with those two, definitions, the question for your team becomes, does the pattern of the student's behavior impede his or her learning or that of others? And this is a question for a student with, a, with an IEP that the case conference team would be making together and, and would then document. So then what's a team to do? If we're not sure if it's a pattern of behavior that's impeding their learning or that of others, we might just make adjustments. And adjustments might be, oh, let's, if Jeff was moving down the halls and we knew he was having troubles, maybe we change his, his route so that he moves through, through a different traffic pattern in the school. Or we might decide that, you know, maybe we're going to make sure that, that um, before he leaves, we give him a, a little reminder of, of where he's going next and what he needs to be doing next. So just a little adjustment, see if that makes a difference. We might decide that maybe we'll support him a little bit differently with, with some accommodations. And accommodations are great because it's the same expectation, but a different path to get there. Um, and, and we've been living in a, in a time where we're using accommodations um, in regards to our health and safety. So we may use a hands-free device of some sort whether it's getting on an elevator or washing our hands. And then sometimes if we know the student well, we can move into that, that coaching mode. You know, just If he just knew how to do this, we know that would, would make things better. If I could just get him from the bus, the bus step to the door of the school, you know, I know we could, you know, things would be so much better the rest of the day. So we, we support the student in teaching them how to specifically do that. It's like coaching. So those could be the things that we do. However, if, if the answer to that question is, yeah, this behavior really is impeding the student's learning or that of others, then, oh my, <laughs> let's go, let's get this back on track, my goodness. You gotta love technology. Okay, here we go. Is it impeding his, his learning or that of others? Ah, there it is. Okay, now, um, then we're gonna document whatever it is we decide to do, whether it's an environmental support, accommodations, or we coach, teach a specific skill, okay, to this student. But it may mean doing it, a little bit more work and, and moving a little, little closer. So when this question, does the pattern of the student's behavior impede his or her learning or that of others is answered with a yes, that's when it's time to develop this well-informed hypothesis. 
because this specific behavior is, is, is impacting the specific setting. And this is the first piece of that process. Conducting a functional behavior assessment. It's one of the, the expectations of individuals that work with students with um, special needs and, and special educators. It's one of the high level practices. And the McCluskey document here that I, is referenced, it's an excellent, excellent book with, um, full of strategies and um, the process of developing those support plans. And it, it's just something that um, you might wanna add to your uh, professional library. So this functional behavior assessment, of course, is, is um, systematically identifying the student's behaviors. And not only do we wanna look at the conditions of the events that predict, but we wanna, we wanna look closely at what's allowing this behavior to continue to happen. So we use two strands. We may use direct assessment data, which means we're gonna collect information from people that are around the student and it's their perceptions. So that might be interviews or checklists or questionnaires or rating scales. And in addition to that, we'll do some direct assessment data collection, which means watching the student, looking at the student across those settings. And it can be as informal as note-taking, or it may be a highly structured observation that requires someone um, with, with training to use that tool. But there's a whole range of um, direct assessment tools that, that might be helpful. So we're gonna gather that data and the questions that we're focusing on as we look at, at Jeff's behavior would be, where does the behavior occur and not occur? What are the contributing factors that lead to, to this behavior potentially? Are there any performance skills or deficits or, or lagging skills we sometimes call them that we need to address for this student? So we're gonna take a deep dive and try to find out exactly what is underlying this behavior. And to do that, we might start with data you already have. You've got assessment data, you've got attendance data, you ha may have behavioral screeners. If you're in a place where we're doing MTSS um, systems or some, some sort of process of, of understanding where kids are and in, in their social, emotional, and behavioral, as well as their academic skills. Uh, we, we might look at all of the things on this list that, that come to um, across our desk, work samples, discipline referrals, any communications you might have with um, parents or, or other staff members. Progress monitoring data is if they already have, a, have goals, take a look at those. And we're looking specifically at what this can tell us about Jeff. We're looking for patterns. <laughs> and there may still be data that we need to collect. And, I, and I've gathered some tools here and I'm actually gonna give you an opportunity to, uh, to do a little bit of a dive into to these materials. Um, on the Padlet, and I'll take you there in just a moment. It, um, you'll find six different types of data collection tools. And um, I'd like for you just to take a few minutes to um, jump on the Padlet. Let's see if I can pull that back up. I'm gonna switch to our Padlet here. And you'll see in this third column, it says um, data dive resources. There are tools. And if you, if you click on them with, with the handprint, it'll open up the tool and you can take a closer look. And when you're ready to look at another one, come back out front and um, Go down the list there, and I'm going to give you a little bit of time to just do a data dive and um, see if some of these tools might be uh, something that can be helpful to you. So I'm going to let you have a few minutes to look at that.
And while you're doing that, let's put on a little music for just a few minutes here. that was just a, a short amount of time, but just a little teaser there for you to take a look at some of the materials. And would love to hear from you what might be um, something that you discovered as you looked at one of those tools, or is there something that looks promising you want to take a, a second look at, closer look? Feel free to drop those comments in the chat about what you saw, or if there's something you'd be would want to come back and take a closer look. Jacinda said the root cause chart seems very helpful. Yes, the Margaret Searle uh, tools. Um, there's also a, a list that she has in there that, that is student focused and it has I statements. So if you're looking to create goals around a particular skill, um, it can certainly get you thinking. The student survey and student inter um, interview form have been mentioned a few times. Mm -hmm. Those are solid tools as well. The, uh, the group interview that um, Dr. Scott, Terry, Terrence Scott um, has in that, that collection. Um, whoops, I was gonna. Is it 
Um, it's it's a it's a group interview where you kind of just guide the discussion. Actually, you could do it you know, virtually if you needed to, where you you have a, the team that of people that work with the student talk about the what they see in their classrooms. And, and there's something about having the group together that you know you say something about what you experienced, and I say, oh, I've never seen that in my classroom, and and it, it can really give you areas of strengths or concerns that come forward because we often just get that information in isolation of, of other staff members and try to then look at it. But when you have a discussion, sometimes it's much richer in coming to, you know, a, a 15 minute discussion about a student may give you much more information than collecting documents from, from eight teachers across the, you know, across the school day. Okay. Well, hopefully there's something here that might be helpful as you are continuing to support students. So. Um, again, feel free to come back to these tools, and, and if you need more information, we're happy to share that with you. Um, Alisa, there was a question yeah. in here about okay. the behavior observation form. It says it allows her to track every 15 seconds. How does that compare to DBR? Oh, I, I don't know that I know the answer to that, how it compares to, I mean, it, it's more, this particular tool, I think, is more informal. Okay. Um, so that, you know, DBR is going to be much more structured and, and that would require some training, you know, and some practice to use that tool more effectively, whereas a, um, a more casual interview, you know, but it would really depend on um, the student that you're looking at, if they're more complex needs, and if you need, you know, or if you have a district that wants you to use those types of tools and is supporting you and in, in the level of training, you might need to use a DBR as opposed to um, this less formal tool. Um, we, we have to, to keep in mind as we, as we share out some of our, our, our information with um, that we have such a wide range of, of skills in the field. And there are some, some districts and some schools that have very rich resources and, and supports to help us do observations and to, and to delve into some of the, um, the more complex tools. And then there, there are other teams that, you know, it may be a team of one that doesn't have the resources. So you know, we try to provide a, a wide range of, of tools to just consider, but that would require really a discussion at, you know, back at the, at the school about what kinds of tools, you know, and what it, what's the information you're really looking for? You know, what's the question that you want to answer? So, good questions. Anything else that came out of there before I, I move past it? This all becomes a part of your functional behavior assessment. You know, whatever you're choosing to, to use as, as the tools. Again, some more formal, some less formal. That would be the decision of, of the team or whatever your school policies are around that. Um, one thing we would encourage you to do, though, is during that time of the reevaluation, I always call it in the meantime, um, document how you're going to support the student, how you're going to support the, the staff, the classroom teacher, you know, those that are working with the student so that everybody's safe so that learning can continue and um, the process of the, the reevaluation, the data collection can go on. And um, you know, sometimes we, you know, we kind of get in, in that meantime, we're, we're working on something, but we may still have some needs um, to support the, te the teachers or the student themselves during that time. And so when that work is done, all the information comes back together and, um, and again, in a perfect world, uh, we would, would suggest that you do this as a team and the team comes together to discuss, so what do we know now? From gathering all this information together, what do we now know about, about this behavior of concern? Does it confirm our original thinking? Do we have new or different information to consider now? And, and can we develop a hypothesis, a reason for the function of this behavior of concern. We might end up with multiple hypotheses. And regardless of whether or not we, we have one or more, we still wanna put them in a format that, that we can, um, can work with. And again, we, we prompted people to use, you know, under 
these conditions, X conditions, the student's likely to do or use this behavior or what we believe are these reasons. And again, that's a very simple format. It can be much more complex and, the, and there are, are tools that can help you do that. But again, you know, we're, we're looking at the range of, of needs across um, our schools across the state. And, and if you're doing this in a place with, with fewer resources, just using the statement of the X conditions um, for what, um, under, I can't even say it, well, um, under X conditions, the student is likely to use Y behavior for Z reasons. Okay, so. Now we wanna take these pieces and, and apply them to Jeff. Okay, and Jeff's kind of our, um, our, our student of the day here. Um, when we look at that data, again, what do we know about Jeff now that we didn't know? What has it confirmed? And what are our hypotheses? And I'm gonna share with you um, here just a, let me go back to the, to the Padlet and share with you just a, um, a document that we've kind of pulled together that could represent the collection of data. And so you've got a team that comes together and this is our analysis of the data that we've collected. We have information now about what are the conditions that contribute to the behavior concern? And I'm not gonna read everything to you, but you know, if you look at this document that we've kind of highlighted some things here, Jeff doesn't ask for help. That's one of the things that was important that, that we found out from, um, he, doesn't he doesn't already have, if he doesn't already have a relationship with, with a, an individual that is or adult that's speaking to him, he's, he's less likely to accept help. He doesn't ask for help from peers either. So when he is um, really struggling, he's kind of isolating himself. Um, the types of tasks when we saw the behavior had to do with reading and written responses. Uh, we got some information from family members and uh, Jeff has siblings and their relationships. And, and from that information, we can begin to pull out um, pieces that might lead us to a hypothesis of this behavior. Behavior happens more often in the morning than later in the day. That wasn't in our original data. Um, the conditions that maintain the behavior, the way the teacher responds to him, the peer reactions, um, when he's removed from the activity or the class. Okay? As we look through the data that we've collected, we should start to see those strands. We should start to see patterns. And again, this is where we would use a, a, a team approach to kind of talk through, how does this, this match up with what we've seen in our classes when we work with, with Jeff? Is this typical? Are we all seeing shades of this? Or, is, or I never see it in my setting and what's different and what do you see in your setting? And this leads us to a hypothesis. And we could have several hypotheses. When he's given an assignment that's involving reading or unfamiliar text, he becomes verbally aggressive and, and threatening physical harm to others to avoid the task. And again, to get to this hypothesis, we went back to all of the things that we, we have now collected and the knowledge base that we have about Jeff, including the, the original behavior of concern when he becomes agitated and, and was threatening others, it would be important to know that his threats have only been verbal. He's never physically approached anyone. Okay, so there may be little nuggets that are, that are within the, this information we've now collected that can help us shape, okay, so we know um, the level of support perhaps we need to give him. We've got some ideas about um, what it looks like across his day. What could be the function of this behavior? This informs our decision, or at least our, our hypothesis. And we may have several.
So this deep dive into the data that we've collected is, is, uh, is a pretty important piece. And again, we'd encourage you to do that but with a team, not on your own, um, just to have richer information. So now that we have a hypothesis, it's time to take that information and do something with it to develop a plan for how we're going to, to teach skills and support the environment of learning. And that plan is gonna include, it's a student with an IEP, specially designed instruction, some environmental supports and some accommodations, or it's possible to have all three of those areas. And when we look at students, some of these supports will be at the individual level where these are things we're doing explicitly for our student. Jeff's gonna have this specially designed instruction. There may be supports that we put in place to allow that instruction to, to happen that can be across the environment and, and maybe it, it looks like something that's available for students other than Jeff. It's an environmental support and, and there are times when um, we certainly have information and, and um, knowledge and skills that would be um, critical for some, like Jeff, but beneficial for others as well. And so they may be, be targeted on a small group or within um, a grade level, um, but they're gonna benefit more than just uh, Jeff. And we may wanna take advantage of some of those opportunities, particularly if, if you are um, working in a, in a multi-tiered um, system of support uh, type of framework where you have different um, opportunities for students to, to be in, in um, groups that are very intensive and individualized all the way through just this is what we do for everyone. So this plan can wrap around Jeff and all of the components that he must have that he that we indicated that he needs to have will be in his IEP. And we want to make sure that those things follow him wherever he goes. He may also reap the benefits of having things that happen in the environment that we just do um, for everyone. But again, if they're critical for him, they will become a part of his specially designed instruction and his IEP, though they may happen across uh, the school uh, setting in general. Just a uh, reminder of the resources we have around specially designed instruction. This was released by the, the state some time ago. And so this is our guidance on you know, what, how we define specially designed instruction, the content methods, the instructional delivery, unique needs of a student. That has not changed and that, and our expectation would be to provide that uh, to Jeff if, if we determined that that was a need. Um, here's some environmental supports. And uh, I like to share these out because they just kind of help us think differently about um, how we might wrap around and support the learning of other skills. You know, if I'm working with a student that is, is um, learning place value and I can use grid paper to help align the numbers so that they can continue to, to, to work on that skill and that allows them to, to really understand what I mean by you know, the ones and the tens and the thousands. Um, that's a simple support that can make a world of difference. Um, selecting and organizing our materials carefully. Um, it may be important for a student to you know, understand elapsed time. How much time has passed? When we say we're gonna work for 15 minutes on this, how long is 15 minutes? You know, these are some of the underlying skills that may support learning. And I um, just wanted to, to share some of these with you as, as supports. Other environmental supports, these are some of my favorites that I've seen at, at the secondary level. Um, the use of study carols uh, was in a, a building some time ago, it was a, a middle school math class, first period of the day. And the instructors had those cafe tables around the edge of the room. So as students came in in the morning, um, some wanted to sit, some could sit at the cafe or stand at the cafe table. And there was even the opportunity to, if, if you knew you might need that, you could, you could uh, request a reservation for it the next day. So you can kind of plan for your needs. 
And those are those are behavioral supports. What do I need to get through this class? What do I need to know and be able to do um, so that I'm in my best uh, learning state and letting kids own some of that? Um, teaching kids how to move around the classroom without distracting others. If movement is something that's that's really important for them to do, we'll let you move, but you, you know, we don't want you interrupting someone else's workspace and time. Okay. And then accommodations. This is just, again, an, another chart to, to help us think through you know, what kind of input or output or levels of support might we provide to students. So some resources for you to uh, take a closer look at later. But then what we need to really think about, you know, we, we have a hypothesis, we've got um, some ideas for um, areas to work with the student, but there's so many needs and so little time. And so think for a moment, what would, what's the most important piece of learning the student needs right now? What could be life-changing? Um, is it about communicating? Is it about um, problem solving? What would be the skill of all the skills that we can, can list that Jeff needs to have or our student needs to work on? What's the critical one at this point in time? And what would we focus on? What's life-changing for Jeff? Given what we know about our student, about Jeff, what's the critical piece of information? What's the critical skill that he needs to own, learn to own, so that he can uh, move successfully through his school days and his learning? Um, is there anything to, out there, any comments or questions that we have in the chat. Jessica, you seen anything else there? I'm I okay. Can't nope. <laughs> Sorry. <about> that. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was just I just I'm not able to see those yeah. things. On the screen. No, not at the moment. I don't see um, any comments about that. But oh, social skills is needed. Um, okay. So in re in regards to to Jeff, some social skills. Okay, what to do with that? Those feelings. Anything else? What would be critical for him to know? The life changing. It might be about um, managing his frustration and when and what that feels like and what I you know what I do with that you may not even know that it's frustration that he's feeling so, so so labeling it so that he understands when you know you know when you get real hot here and you, you know your face gets warm and and um, you start thinking you know one thought about you know I can't do this or you know you, when that happens that could that can be your frustration and so what can we do with that? How can we help you manage that? Yeah, uh, calming strategies. Uh, and then another one, positive support towards independent work came through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there might be some, some learning issues in there. If, if the, the language arts reading skills are weak, maybe we, you know, we need to, to understand that a little bit. And Jeff needs to understand that this is a skill you can learn. You can learn to get better at this. You know, Sometimes you can lessen the frustration by just, you know, an understanding and an acknowledgement of, yeah, yeah, this is what we can do about that. <laughs> you know. Okay. Whatever the team decides to do, wherever you, you determine you're going to go next, with this, this plan is now we've got to get to actually putting the plan into action. You know, we've talked about we're going to work on these skills. Um, so we'll have to plan for that explicit instruction. Um, Evidence-based practices would be the, the tools that we would use because we wanna teach Jeff to, to do something other than the behavior he's used. Again, it has to match up to, this, to his, the function of his behavior, but we wanna make intentional changes 
intentional environmental changes to set Jeff up to be more likely to use his newly learned skills, those replacement skills. And if you're looking for evidence-based practices, um, the evidence-based um, interventions network out of University of Missouri, um, there's some research by Tom Lewis, um, Terrence Scott, Kathy Lane from Kansas, that there are many of our, our uh, colleagues out there that are doing the work of identifying evidence-based practices in content areas, as well as behavior. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna work on this, we wanna use those, those tools and those strategies that are proven to be effective if they are used in the manner that they were intended to be used. Okay. So I, I can't just grab Elisa's favorite, <laughs> favorite tool. That may not be the right match for, for Jeff or for a student that I'm working with, but th those are resources that, um, that you can um, look into. That evidence-based network has not only strategies um, and tools, but they, they've also started to build a repertoire of, of, um, of scripts and, and, and how to teach through the skills as well. So. Um, um. Alisa, that's out of the University of Missouri, right? Missouri. Yes. Yes. Based practice. Mm -hmm. EBI network. The what network? EBI evidence based interventions okay. network. Okay, we had someone asking for the link to that. So I'm going to find it and drop it in the chat for you guys. EBI. Yeah, if you, and you just you know, do a search for um, EBI Missouri or Chris Tillman Riley, Riley Tillman. Those are all his names. I'm not sure I have them in the right order, <laughs> um, but excellent resources. So we're gonna plan for the explicit instruction. We're gonna use the tools that are most effective and evidence-based, and we're gonna be very intentional about setting up the environment for that new learning. Okay. And then we have to make sure that we implement the plan. Okay, and it sounds so simple. It sounds like, yes, of course. But we need to th think about who needs to support this plan. Okay, if, if it's just in, if it's language arts that we're focusing on as part of the skills for Jeff, um, how's that gonna touch his day? Who needs to, to understand how we're working with him on developing his, his um, language skills? And where would it benefit to tuck that learning into his day? Okay. We've got to make sure that um, we share out what are the behavioral supports? Who's going to be responsible for, for helping us shape the environment and making sure that all the, the third grade teachers know the vocabulary that we're using to prompt him? Okay. Those pieces need to be addressed so that we have a, a, a complete um, plan that wraps around the student and his needs. And again, some of the things that we're doing explicitly for Jeff may be beneficial for other learners as well. Okay. Another piece of the plan is, is monitoring. What are we going to measure? How are we going to know that the instruction is happening with fidelity and that the student is growing and he's learning these skills? Who's going to document the progress? and report out so that the team knows, you know, this is how things are going, Jeff is learning, or we're not making any progress right now. Who's gonna interpret that data and, and share it out to, to others that need to know? How often are we gonna report progress? When will we decide, how will we decide that it, we need to make a change here? This is working or this is not working. If it's working and we've made progress and we can celebrate, we wanna do that. If something's not working and we discover it's because we haven't, um, haven't quite been, been um, providing the, those um, skill lessons and those, those practices with fidelity, then how do we adjust so that that can happen? And then of course, when, you know, when it's, when the skill has been addressed and he's made progress and we're ready to move on to another skill, what we should definitely celebrate. And then what's the next piece that, that needs to, to be addressed or is our work here finished for the time being? Oh, 
all this requires the work of a coordinated effort. And uh, it can be beneficial and it is beneficial. Um, but here are the other pieces that, uh, again, that, that um, we wanna make sure we cover, informing staff, equipping st um, staff with the skills they need and so on. So <clears throat> we've talked a little bit but, um, about barriers to doing this. And I would really love to have a, um, a few minutes of time to just maybe problem solve. How do you do this? How, how can we work through a comprehensive process like this um, with, the, with the challenges of our, our school days and, and our resources? And um, I'm counting on, on you to be able to, to share some with your colleagues about you know, how, how might this look or how could this work um, in your setting, whether it's elementary or secondary or um, a, a self-contained programming of some sort or a grade, grade level wide um, initiative. What are some of the things that, that you are doing you would like to do to be able to support students in their behavioral um, growth? Um, we have a comment from Rachel. She was talking, asking about like, I think this leads into it, good resources for student facing behavior charts for them to track their goals and earn rewards, like more in the older grades of like grade five, um, just putting some of that responsibility and yes. ownership on them. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the, it, it was rather simple, but um, one of the things we did at secondary would have you know, whatever the the goal was, the skill was that we're working on. Um, the student tracked their progress, their, their classroom teachers tracked the progress and I tracked the progress. You know, we, you know, we had a, a joint way to do that. But I always had a, a discussion with the student, you know, how they thought they were doing and how we as staff thought the student was doing. It was just like a five or six minute come together. So, you know, how are you doing on um, not using the, the foul language and, um, in science class and the student could give me their perspective. And I said, well, okay, let me tell you what, you know, <laughs> what we're, what we're hearing here. And sometimes it was close and sometimes there's a lot of dissonance, but just that, just a couple minutes of, of, you know, how's it going? How do you see it? How do we see it was enough to, to kind of encourage the student that, well, they're serious about this. And, and many times they, they were accurate on how they saw things, which then was an opportunity to, to give some positive feedback. And we know how that grows skills, um, but you know, for for older kids, having a you know owning a piece of it. You know, for younger, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, um, going yeah that piece. Even those conversations with younger kiddos too are huge because it you know it gets them in that thought process of thinking about those things. Um, one like visual piece of it, we used to do that conversation piece at the end of like each period or act like, you know, when they're moving or you're moving on to something else, uh, you know, at the end of the day, they go through and they track, you know, whatever points to see if like they're going up and doing really mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. um, just kind of like what you decide so that they can visually see it and maybe keep their data in a folder. But um, also, you, you know, you as the teacher tracking it as well. Um, the PBIS World Data Tracking has some stuff on there um, okay. that I'll drop that link into the chat. But yeah, a lot of it I think is just having that conversation, like you said, and then coming in at the end of the day and maybe tracking like their progress or maybe at the end of that period of you know tracking that piece as well mm -hmm. might be helpful. Um, go ahead, yeah. No, I was just gonna say, sir. I was, are there other with all the teachers have going on, how do we, how do we yeah. get? Yes. Um, Rachel, I dropped the link to PBIS. Okay. Well, maybe okay. I can look at some more. Uh, Carla uh, made the, she said that her school has um, introduced the interoception curriculum by Kelly um, Mahler. I think I might be saying that wrong. Um, they've had a huge success with that and they highly recommend that for curriculum for students who have gone through trauma as well as kiddos um, on the spectrum. Hmm. Uh, 
So that's a suggestion if your school has that. Um, oh, uh, Jacinda asked, like, how do we get teachers to track with fidelity? Oftentimes oh. you start off well, um, it's, but it falls apart. It's It's got to be simple. I mean, you know, and, and time efficient. And then, you know, and then we need to, to use it, you know, make sure that we're using it, you know, whatever they give us, we've got, you know, because if it feels like, or, or it looks like, oh, this is just busy work and, and nothing's happening with it, that makes it harder to continue. Um, anything that can be, you know, if we can leverage, you know, electronics, you know, where you can, you know, tally or, or you know, create some type of a, um, you know, an input or that sometimes, at the secondary level, you know, that sometimes makes a difference because you just it gives you more time to to not spend on <laughs> on recording data. Um, but it's a real commitment when when we're addressing behavior. You know, it's a real commitment to see it through, and um, you know that is a challenge. However, if when we do that, you know. Checklist. I just saw. I saw that fly by on, on the, um, the list. You, you know, using tools that can make it easier, but we still have to do the work of it, and that's that's really going to be what makes the difference. You know, that we we've attended to it and we stay with it, and and we celebrate. You know, the the growth, and we acknowledge it, and um, and hold students you know accountable for their their learning and and you know because it is their learning curve and, and yes you are developing these skills these are yours and um, this isn't something I'm doing to you it's something I'm doing with you and um, you know that investment um, your colleagues are, are mentioning some other resources I think um, yeah in the chat um, someone asked what the suggested curriculum was I dropped that into the chat. And kind of going off what you're saying is, you know, building these behavior intervention plans, like that team piece is so important. So that teacher or the teachers that are taking that data being on that team is really important. And then going back to what Elisa said is that, you know, you're working together, but making sure that you're using, like you're gathering that data from that teacher often so that they know that it's being used. Um, sometimes, you know, we get really, really busy and I cannot even imagine how busy you guys are right now. And, you know, like we'll grab that behavior documentation, you know, every two weeks or sometimes it falls behind and, you know, you've got all this progress and stuff, but gathering that is super helpful so that they know that you're looking at it and you're making, you know, those tweaks or we need to have a more conversation or I'm noticing this is improving, but this is falling, you know, apart a little bit. And then they also know that like you're invested in that piece. So um, a lot of conversation and checking in on those things, you know, knowing if you need to add another um, intervention, but, you know, keeping it as simple as possible, you know, is it, you're looking at it in art class and you're focusing on, you know, staying in their space. Like, was it a one, two or three? Were they perfect or were they not? Like that type of thing mm -hmm. uh, is helpful. Just very simple because yeah. a gen ed teacher having to take data every, you know. Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's not, that's not realistic to be able to do it every day. But so when we do it, you know, let's, how often do we need to do it to get the information that we need. There may be a short amount of time where we've got to, we've really got to do it intensely. And then, you know, for a week, it's going to be intense. And then you know, we're going to take that information and, and make other decisions so that it's not, you know, every day I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep up with, you know, the, and whatever data we do get, as you said, got to use it because <laughs> it, 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 it has to be meaningful um, use of, of time and, and skills and talents. And, um, and we want to make decisions from it. And if we don't have that information, it's, it's really difficult to make an informed decision. So that, you know, there's that balance of. Yeah. And I think having that plan of um, when you're going to come back around to kind of talk about that data, even if it's a little informally of like, hey, I'm going to get with this kid's team and we're going to get some feedback on all of that so that mm -hmm. you can pull that data. and you know, letting them know that 
that's information that they're expected to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Um, They know like, oh yeah, I need to have this data because every three weeks we sit down and talk about Jeff and how he's doing. Like I need to bring that so that we can have that conversation. If I don't have it, you know, so maybe setting that schedule when you're going to talk about those Mm -hmm. things, um, setting a schedule, you know, when you or other teachers are going to go in and take data. Those are all, those are structured ways that you can get Mm -hmm. them to um, continuously stay engaged in that Mm -hmm. process. Um, And, you know, they've had some great ideas about tools and and things they're using. You know, one, what we could do is on the Padlet, you can add a, a section where if you've got, you know, a a tool or, or something that you're using that's been real effective, you could just list it there because it'll just take us a, you know, a, a, a minute to, to set up another, you know, another, so another row maybe on the end of the Padlet there for just um, shared resources or, or you know, give it some title. Um, yeah. Would that be helpful? Actually, Emily just asked for that. So. Well, Emily, you're, yeah, great. I, <laughs> cool. Well, I mean, as you talked about and, and you know, shared some of the, the tools that people are using. Yeah, just and it's it's you know, this is just a place for you to go and, and take a look at some and, and you know, download the name and, and you know, check yeah. it out because they're you, know, you guys are doing this work every day. Um, and, and after doing the work, you're, you're applying the work and making decisions about kiddos. And, and that's that's really where. You know, the importance of it is that you know we, we collect information and then we, we use it so that we can support students and see a change in, in um, their behavioral needs. Elisa, would you like me to add that section for um, the attendees to add those pieces? Yeah. That- yeah. Let's do it. So that way you've got, so um, when you use that Padlet link, you'll be able to scroll all the way over to the the end of it and there'll be a place where you can just kind of you know and share share your knowledge based on some of those tools and it might be a way to to grow your resources is there anything else that we can do to support you that just kind of popped in we've got a few minutes left how can ip resource center support the work that you are doing Try to bring your resources, connect you to uh, some of the, the people in the field that, that um, you know, bring um, folks in for focus on inclusion. We'll have another set of resources after we've um, we spent some time with, with um, Terry Scott and some of the other folks that are going um, gonna to be with us uh, next month. So. Um. Great, thanks. You've got that up. I just I just pulled up the chat. Um, replacement behavior suggestions. You want to expand on that a little bit? Looks like Megan. Yeah. Looking for aggressive behaviors. Aggressive behaviors. Okay. Oh, off my head. I'm trying to think of tools. Um, but we'll add we'll add that to our list and see if we can come up with some do some looking and um. We can share those out. I think um, a lot of it goes into that teaching this, you know, looking at what the trigger is and then teaching that, you know, strategy or skill of how to respond when that certain thing happens. So a lot of times um, replacement behaviors are really hard to teach if we don't have that um consistent conversation, either like a debrief or a prep for the day or 
a, a consistent like social group for that student to talk about those things. And then for those aggressive behaviors to be able to um, remind or prompt to use that right before something that might be triggering to that student in that environment. And then um, positive, positive praise for when they use that replacement mm-hmm. behavior in either a small group and then in the um, in the whole group environment, those types of things. But replacement behaviors, we have to teach that behavior um, and teach the child to identify what is happening before and what triggers them for that aggressive behavior. So um, it has to be taught in mm-hmm. small group. Uh, like it can't, it's gotta be kind of um, this like more than just once and then working on use like translating that to gen ed. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lisa, yeah. if there's anything else. No, it's, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's taught like any other, you know, if, if we were teaching someone to read, <laughs> you know, we wouldn't just, I think you mentioned that the, the other day, um, yeah. you, know, you know, don't forget your, your ah sounds, you know, you know, in passing yeah. in the hall, don't forget to use those yeah. in class. You know, we, we explicitly teach we practice, we give feedback yeah. and that has to happen um, for, yeah. for behaviors, particularly yeah. for aggressive behaviors. We want to break that, that pattern of you know, defaulting, you know, to the physical and, and, you know, stop, a, you know, stop a click. And you know, so th- that practice that, and over and over again, and explicit instruction, it's no different. Teaching behavior is no different than teaching any other academic content area. You know, you, it has to be planned. It has to be explicit. It has to be followed up, has to be practiced, um, and with feedback. And, uh, for some of our kiddos, it's so important that this has to happen during the school day or, or as a part of their instructional day. And it's critical for their success. And um, it may be short term, you know, it may not be you know, for nine weeks, but it may be for four weeks that we explicitly work on this skill. And that commitment, uh, that level of commitment is no different than you know, teaching fractions. <laughs> you know, we don't just teach part of it and move on. You know, we teach the whole process and there are kids that don't get it the first time. And so, you know, and so it comes up again and, and, and so on. Megan, does that kind of answer your question or are you looking for like specific replacement behaviors? Um, going back, there was a question earlier. It was a little more of like a technical question, but maybe, um, it would be helpful to other teachers, um, when writing these things. And I think it was Nicole, someone did have more questions. Um, so we can talk about, uh, the drop-down boxes available in IIEP don't really allow for a good description of how a behavior plan will be monitored. Should this be written in the notes, like the specifics, or just included as part of the monitoring on the goal? Well, the monitoring, my first thought is, you know, having it with the monitoring on the goal, you know, because attaching it there is, it's more likely to be, uh, you can then record it in the progress monitoring section, you know, if there's a behavioral goal that's attached to it. Um, yeah. That, you know, that, and um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else in there that would, um, you always have the opportunity to, to um, determine if you want to meet again, you know, and put it in and have a, you know, set a date for an, another meeting in the future. Um, just to, you know, it, it would be an IEP meeting, but you know, and every time you, every time you address the IEP, or have a have a, you know, any time you would have a, a conference, you can always address the behavioral pieces, um, and determine whether or not that changes that if it any way impacts the the intervention plan that you have in place. You know, you may be t- coming into the IEP to talk about, um, we're 
there's a change in services around language arts. But if that's something that may may impact what's going on with the behavior plan that's been in place, you can also note that in the IEP as well. There's a place at the end of the behavioral section where you can say this plan is going to continue as it was developed or we've made revisions to the plan. Um, that's another place where you can kind of you know, document what's going on with the, with the plan itself, if, if it's been tweaked or if it's been impacted by something else. Um, if you can look at the, I think, yeah, in the progress monitoring, you can outline that as well. Mm -hmm. or something else as well. There's another question. Megan just followed up saying that he's five and doesn't, um, there's no identified triggers right now. And then Clyde also noted that like developing a plan for a kindergartner who's five years old, like what would be some suggestions to meet that? I think a lot of our teachers are struggling with those younger ages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have. Well, th those little ones haven't had a typical school year <laughs> oh. in, in their whole school career at this point. Yeah. Um, oh, gosh. I mean, I think starting out just like if you don't know what the triggers are, um, like a simple ABC chart of antecedent behavior, you know, consequence, like, you know, if it was reading and they had to go to small group, but then he flipped a desk and the consequence was removal, like you're kind of looking at those things and you could find a, a pattern there and see if you can find a trigger, Megan, like that way. Um maybe starting with that ABC chart. What do you think, Elisa? Well, I, you know, I'm actually going back further than that. You know, what have the expectations for moving, moving to reading group um, been, been taught and practiced with, with, you know, if, if it's about moving from one group, you know, whatever the behavior is, let's say it's, it's um, transitioning to reading group and, and participating. Um, how, how are kids supposed to move that way? How is this student supposed to do that? Has it been practiced? You know, has it been taught? Has it been practiced? Has it been reinforced before? You know, it, it's just a problem for him to move to the next. You know, now we have a problem for moving to the next place. Um, so back up. What do we expect kids to do? Have we explicitly taught this and practiced it with, with this kiddo? Um, you know, where are your hands supposed to be? You know, they can't be on anybody else. And you know, whatever it is, you know, kind of over teaching that skill to see where where it kind of falls apart. You know, if it's, you know, he, he doesn't even get out of the chair, but he gets up and starts over and something happens. Okay, well, he got up, he started over. And then, you know, what's going on at this, you know, the third step of that. Um, and if our expectation is you get your materials, you know, you keep your hands to yourself and you, you, know, you do whatever those expectations are, where is it falling apart there as well? Because so many times we haven't really explicitly taught for a lot of our kids, they really need it explicitly taught every step. I assume nothing. You know, I'm going to tell you how Ms. Stovall wants this to roll in her classroom. This is how we're going to do this. It may be different than how Ms. Benhack does it. But when you're with Ms. Stovall, this is, you know, this is what it looks like. This is what it sounds like. This is what we do. And you know, it it may just be part of the transitioning of, you know, of, rut of routines. It may be something more, or it may be, oh, you just didn't know that step was, you know, <laughs> was a part of it. And, um, and that can also give you data. Once you know what your expectations are, where is he falling off or she falling off in those expectations? And that's the point where, you know, now you can track and say, okay, you need to focus on this piece of it more. Um, because at first it just seems like stuff's just happening. <laughs> you know, I asked them all to move and one didn't. And, but taking a closer look and rethinking how did, how did we teach this out? Because expectations are different in every setting across their day. And sometimes in the same setting, different activities, the expectations are different for how we move, what we can say, or whether we need to be quiet. Um, it's complex for some, some kiddos. And knowing too that we, especially right now with kids being in and out for the past year or so of like missing 10 days or whatever, it may be that those 
Um, for some kids, they may know it and be able to jump right back into the environment. Other kiddos may need that like reteaching, practicing, all those things um, because their education and normalcy has been uh, interrupted due to maybe a quarantine or something like that. So I'm mm-hmm. um, going back and reteaching those things to see if that helps. And then, you know, giving that explicit feedback, positive praise um, when they do do it right. Yeah. But using all that info to help guide your support is important. And again, if, if you can, if you have a colleague or a, a, a team that you can bounce these things off of, um, you know, that that's, that's healthy for all of us, you know, so you don't have to carry that, you know, the, the stress of this the situation on your own. Uh, it, it's just so hard. It's so, so challenging these days. Um, we've added the, the new area onto the, the Padlet and you have access to that and it will, you'll have access to that at least for the next year. <laughs> um, we don't typically take them down you know, right away because we know that individuals like to use that information. And um, if, if it's beneficial, we want to share it. Um, okay, we've talked a little bit about behavior here. Our time is just about up. If you want to, uh, to <laughs> give your, your feedback on which puppy best represents your feelings and thoughts right about now that you've had some time to uh, talk with your colleagues and listen and, and um, maybe reflect on a few things. Uh, if you want to throw that into the chat, your, your puppy number, you can. If not, here's how you can reach evaluation information or, or our resource center in regards to other activities and, and uh, programs coming up. There is my contact information, and um, I wasn't able to change this slide. It was, um, I was going to add yours, Jessica. I'm going to uh, have to go back to uh, Felicia and see if we can get those both put on there. Um, okay. So we can, we can be legitimately a team. And um, we, we do appreciate the, the time that you spent with us and hope that there's, there's a nugget or two that you've been able to, to take away um, as you balance the load that you're carrying right now. And um, we appreciate you and your time. And we appreciate your feedback. Let us know what we need to be doing for you. And uh, be well. Thank you for spending some time with us this afternoon, this morning, it's afternoon here.